Do you guys remember my buddy, David Graham? I'm having a great time. David has appeared in a few of my videos and I've mentioned him numerous times. Anyway, Dave and I have been arguing about the Oilers for about three or four months now. This all started right around the time of the NHL trade deadline. I felt the Oilers shouldn't make any moves and Dave thought they should go all in and try to win the cup. Now, Dave, who admittedly, like many Oilers fans, needs therapy for the past 15 years, believes that, and I quote, Ken Holland is an idiot. He told me that he wanted that on the record. So there it is. Now, before I get into the Duncan Keith stuff and whether I agree with David now, I just want to back up a little bit and explain my stance. This past year, the Oilers were a flawed team. This was very easy to see. They had monstrous seasons from McDavid, Dreisaitl, Nurse, and Mike Smith of all people, and rode their performances to second place in the North Division. When the trade deadline came along, I really didn't see the point in making a bunch of moves because I felt the Oilers were probably at least four to five pieces away from even being a legitimate contender. With a bunch of cap space opening up in the summer, I felt it would be wiser to hold on to draft picks and prospects until the summer and then be very aggressive in building a Stanley Cup contender for the next five years. Watching the Toronto Maple Leafs give up a bunch of assets only to crash and burn reaffirmed my viewpoint that it was better to wait and load up in the offseason. Now, when the news broke at the end of June that the Hawks were working to move Duncan Keith closer to the West Coast, I was confused why the Oilers would even be interested. Now, do not get me wrong here, I am not trashing Duncan Keith. He has had a wonderful career. I'm well aware of the success that he's had. It's kind of hard not to be since the Edmonton media won't shut up about it. Keith was one of the league's elite defensemen for about a decade and will almost certainly be a Hall of Famer after he retires. The problem, of course, with Keith is that all of his accolades are referred to in the distant past tense. Now, I'm not what you would call an analytics buff, but I have enough of a handle on them to understand that this chart is an enormous red flag. The quality of Keith's play has been in steady decline for the past few seasons. Again, this is not a knock on Duncan Keith specifically. This is just the natural progression of a player's career as they get older. What made Keith an even less attractive player to acquire was the fact that he carries a $5.5 million cap hit for the next two years. So let's just quickly recap. His play has deteriorated significantly, he's not getting any younger, and he's overpaid. What's not to like? Now, here's the thing. I don't disagree with the Oilers wanting to bring in more leadership. It seems pretty clear that the top players on the team have stated that they want management to bring in more veteran leadership to support them. So this is definitely something that should be addressed. But there is absolutely no reason to be paying such a high cost for leadership and experience. Look at Corey Perry. The guy is practically skating on his ankles now, but he still provides good leadership in the playoffs. So teams are happy to bring him in for $750,000. As much as I can't stand the guy, the Oilers could even go out and sign Ryan Getzlav to a cheap one-year contract to fill that role. Or, here's a thought, trade a player whose play has deteriorated, who is aging, and who makes too much money for Duncan Keith. Now, I want to pause here to talk about boundaries. This is one of my favorite subjects. Just ask my wife. No is a complete sentence. Yes, I love it. Thanks, honey. When I was young, I had a really difficult time dealing with conflict. I can remember two specific incidents where I really struggled and it bit me in the butt. The first one was when I was about 21 years old 
and I was riding my bike to work and as I approached this intersection, someone pulled up and was turning right in front of me, but they didn't look my way. I slammed on my brakes, but they still crunched my front tire. And I could not bring myself to say, you made a mistake, you need to take responsibility and fix my bike or get me a new one. All I did was ask that they would drive me the rest of the way to work. And the second story also involves a collision. I had borrowed my sister's car and it was parked outside my house. And the neighbor recklessly backed up out of their driveway, slammed into the driver's side door and shattered the window. Now, fortunately, they were nice enough to come over and inform me what had happened, but I was so uncomfortable bringing up that she needed to pay for the damage that I was like, ah, don't even worry about it. <sighs> and then one day, a friend of mine lent me the book Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. This book literally changed my life. I realized that boundaries are difficult to put up and enforce, but when you do, it keeps you and your stuff safe. Now, back to the Keith trade. Let's look at this from the Blackhawks perspective. Keith has requested a trade and to a specific region of North America. He also has a full no movement clause, which means he can dictate which city he goes to. Not only that, he prefers to go to Edmonton because he believes they're closer to winning the Stanley Cup than Calgary, Vancouver, or Seattle. Add to that the fact that Keith's contract is much too big at this stage of his career, and I think it is more than fair to say that Stan Bowman is in a very tight spot here. So, Stan Bowman has a problem. Ken Holland has a problem too. He needs to add leadership, but he has lots of options. But Stan Bowman has basically no options. Now, I'm no genius NHL general manager. I'm just a guy who likes to watch hockey and talk about it. But knowing what I know about boundaries, if I'm Ken Holland, I pick up the phone, I call Stan Bowman and I say, look, we understand that Keith wants to come here, but we're not going to take on his contract unless we send some bad money back the other way. We will trade you James Neal straight across for Duncan Keith. And if Bowman responds asking for anything additional in the trade, I simply say, no thank you, and walk away. Edmonton was under zero obligation to make this deal. As far as I know, no one was holding a gun to Ken Holland's head and saying, you have to trade for Duncan Keith. But he did. And not only that, he traded a pretty solid player and a draft pick to do it. Make no mistake, Edmonton's management blew this big time. And Holland knows he screwed this deal up because when he was pressed about acquiring and paying such a high price for an old, overpaid defenseman, he got defensive and condescending in his responses. Would well, you want me to get him for free? Yeah, Ken, pretty much. He's very close to having a negative value. Toronto had to trade a first round pick to Carolina a few years ago to take Patrick Marlowe's contract and buy him out. Listen to this next doozy. I looked at the guide and record book. I could say so much about this, but I'm just going to use one example. Fun fact, my dad lived with former Oilers great Marc Messier when he was a teenager. Now, Messier is often cited as one of the greatest leaders in pro sports. He won six Stanley Cups and was the captain of two of those teams. Many commentators point to him guaranteeing a win in Game 6 of the 1994 Eastern Conference Finals and then backing up what he said 
by going out and scoring a hat trick. Pretty impressive stuff. Now, let's check old Kenny Holland's guide and record book here and look at the back half of Messier's career. It appears as though Messier missed the playoffs the final seven years he was in the National Hockey League. The point I'm making is this. Oilers fans couldn't give a flying what Duncan Keith did in years past. They only care what he's going to do this upcoming season. Look, there's nothing wrong with the water in Edmonton. The Oilers leadership group simply doesn't understand how to properly value and manage their assets. 